It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry LeSeur, CBS News correspondent, and Kenneth Crawford, National Affairs Editor of Newsweek magazine. Our very distinguished guest for this evening is Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The North Pole used to be a no man's land, but uh, these are the days when, by buying a ticket on a commercial airliner, you can fly across the North Pole and drink a cocktail at the same time. Yet only three score or more years ago, about 35 years ago, our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that, unexplored. This is a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, do you hope to see that? I do. <laughs> well, Admiral, yeah. would you say that uh, since you've been to both the extremities of Earth, are these expeditions to such far off places, are they getting easier because of modern techniques or is, still, is danger still close at hand? Well, it's a little risky, but nothing like it used to be with the old slow planes and the small cruising radius where we had to put down bases. We replaced the dog teams, and of course that was a big improvement. But now the planes go much faster, and they are safer, and they have a much bigger cruising radius. You haven't got the danger of a terribly heavy load. Mm -hmm. Admiral, a, an expedition to which I believe you're the advisor is now en route. Uh, what is that expedition doing? Well, that's the icebreaker ATCA, and it's a reconnaissance expedition. It's going down to the South Pole area to make certain observations and to, to look for some bases. They will be back in April, and they will report back, and upon the information we get from that undertaking, uh, we will base the bigger expedition that's to follow. Uh, is that very definitely planned, or uh, is that... Uh, that is being planned right now. So I'm willing to say to you that uh, there will be a number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year, the bottom of the world, because the government has really become interested. Well, Admiral Byrd, I can understand, I think everybody can, the interest in the North Pole, because it's so near our greatest challenger, Soviet Russia. But why this interest in the bottom of the world? And nobody living down there, is there? No, it's, um, it's pretty cold. There's only one permanent resident, that's the Emperor Penguin. The little ones live further north. I tell you one reason they're interested. It's by far the most uh, valuable, important place left in the world for science. That's why the scientific groups all over the nation are really interested. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation, those to come after us, or even uh, during your lifetime. Because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. And uh, 
You know, as the world swings with an ever-increasing acceleration, far-flung places, once useless like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Uh, does it, I was going to ask you, does it have military importance? Uh, it has some, and uh, as the world shrinks, it will continue to shrink with an ever-increasing acceleration, thus bringing these places closer. And in the future, I can see a time when it will be very, very important strategically. Well, has the development and, and of air power increased there, the strategic importance of places like the uh, oh, very much Palmer so. Peninsula, we'll say? Uh, very much so. Even now, if uh, anything happened and we uh, lost the Panama Canal, we would have to control the islands just north of Antarctica, which are part of Antarctica. I've and between there and Cape Horn. I've heard it said that uh, there are seven continents in the world, and one of them has never been seen by a woman, and that's Antarctica. Is that actually true? Well, if the power position is an island, as far as I know, that's true. No woman's ever stepped foot upon the Antarctic continent, and it's the most peaceful place in the world. Well, I'm sure that <laughs> won't last very long. Uh, <clears throat> it's, I understand that now that you're working with the, uh, the Arnold Bread Company in charge of frozen foods. Now, is there any future for frozen foods down these frozen extremities? Well, I think the uh, human race can be helped uh, by that. Uh, this was thought out by Dean Arnold, who's, uh, in my opinion, a great humanitarian. He uh, learned that we went down there after four or five years and finished a meal that we had left there on the table when we had evacuated Little America. Everything was perfect, including the bread. So he got the idea of this frozen bread, and already we sent some to, he sent some to Europe and just very, worked very well over there for the, some of the starving people. Yes, so you can store it down in the Antarctic and against the lean years, and you wouldn't have any people in the world really starving if you did that. Yes, in the event of an atomic war... You'd stay there forever. Admiral, you speak of the resources of Antarctica. What are they? What, uh, what are the natural resources there? Well, uh, we've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains that's not covered with snow, enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Well, uh, that's, that's the coal. Now, there's evidence of uh, other, many other minerals uh, we are pretty sure there's oil. Now, that coal shows the bottom of the world. Now, by far, the coldest spot in the world. Where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well... Uh, it was once tropical. So, uh, we think there's oil there, and there's evidence... probably uranium there. Is it any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible, wouldn't it? Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come when we can, we'll have to go after that stuff down there. Well, you know, I, I avoided what you said about uranium. I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have the world fight over the Antarctic. And Robert, is there a competition among other nations to try to get information about uh, Antarctica and uh, possibly to secure some of these resources? Well, uh, yes. Uh, there are now seven nations very much interested. Russia is interested. Tremendously. That I'm sure of. Australia has an expedition down there. The Argentine, the Chile, New Zealand, Britain, and so on. Now, you can understand those people down there being uh, interested because they live down there. The New Zealanders, the Argentinians, the Chileans, and the Australians. And so uh, we, uh, we don't do much about claiming anything. Admiral, you uh, make Do this sound a little crowded. Uh, uh, are, are, are there that many expeditions now there or en route there? Uh, well, you know, as I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long because of this intense interest on the part of, uh, of other nations and this nation. Well, Admiral Byrd, are yeah. private expeditions a thing of the past? Is, is expedition and exploration, making expedition and exploration now a purely a government function because uh, of the tremendous power no, organization? No, I don't think so. I think down south, it may be more or less a thing of the past, but not other, other expeditions that go, there's a lot of them going north now. This latest expedition now on the way is a government expedition, I take it? Yes, that's the government. 
Well, Bear, may I ask you, is there a great difference between the uh, top of the world and the bottom of the world? Uh, there oh. is. Now, uh, the North Pole is the center of an ocean 10,000 feet deep. The South Pole, the center of a plateau, 10,000 feet high. The North Polar Sea is surrounded by um, continents that are slightly frozen. The Antarctic continent is surrounded by uh, a belt of ice, frozen seas of at least 1,200 miles thick. Now, the south is a plateau. It gets, in some places, 14,000 feet up. Uh, I've been over areas about 13,000, and it's a little bit chilly up there. So there's, a, there's that big difference between the top and bottom of the world. I don't... Con the north really isn't very cold up there on the Arctic Ocean. Not compared to south. I don't know, we often hear it said that our young Americans now aren't as hardy as their forefathers. Do you think that Americans do measure up to the standards, uh, the physical standards and morale standards of the past? I do. I don't believe that. I think they're just as hardy. Well, what would you say was the most uh, valuable factor on expedition? Is it uh, morale or uh, physical courage or is it uh, sheer equipment? Well, I've always thought that loyalty was by far the most important trait. The British told me that when I first went down 28, that I couldn't possibly get through the winter night without a mutiny if I took more than 20 men. But to serve science, I had to take 42 men. And then I took 56 the next time, and so on. So, and I did find that loyalty was the most important thing during the winter night when it's very hard on your nerves. Is, uh, I think that's best trait. That's, that's a very valuable characteristic at any time. Well, thank you very much, Admiral Bird. It's been well, a great pleasure to have you here tonight. It's a pleasure to be with you. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Kenneth Crawford. Our distinguished guest was Admiral Richard E. Bird. At the end of the Second World War, the extraterrestrials ensured that the technology was returned from Earth back to these cities. They understood that the Dark Age had not yet reached its peak. The technology was returned by 30 submarines through a large commando action. Okay, let's pick up the scenario. We were originally talking about the spiriting out of the two spacecraft out of Berlin before the Allies arrived. Uh, we said that they were put aboard two submarines. They spent six months at sea, and they finally landed in Argentina. Now, from that point, they were taken into Antarctica, into a section of Antarctica called Queen's Mods Land. And there they disappeared, and uh, they were not heard of for some time. Now, intelligence sources, and of course, I was in the intelligence business at that time uh, with the, the agency, reports indicated that they were in there and they were operative once again. Now, there was a major concern by world powers to go in and capture the technology and the two spacecraft, which they knew were in Antarctica. And the intelligence reports indicated that one known as Admiral Byrd was to be recommissioned and he was to be sent in there to retrieve the two saucers and also the technology and personnel associated with it. Later reports indicated that Admiral Byrd was given eight months and unlimited funding to go in and uh, pull this thing uh, successfully off. But we also know that within eight weeks he was totally defeated. Now the supposition at that point was that there was an advanced uh, civilization and technology, most probably alien. There were with the Third Reich and the SS who was in Antarctica and that those great and developed uh, technologies were used to defeat uh, Admiral Byrd. And of course, as it turns out, even to date, they're still there. We never did successfully get them. The stories that I've uncovered about the inner Earth is that very early on in the history of the Third Reich, the um, Nazi elite, and especially Hitler, were trying to establish contact with the civilization living in the inner Earth, which was considered a 
an Aryan civilization of an, a lot more advanced nature than their brothers, lost brothers living on the surface of the planet. Uh, carries the name of the former capital of that civilization, someplace uh, around present-day Greenland, before the previous polar ships and before Greenland became under ice. Two expeditions were made in the late 30s, early 40s, one attempting to enter the North Polar water opening with a submarine, which proved unsuccessful. A second attempt was made to enter the land opening on the South Pole with an anti-gravity cigar-shaped device, basically a small prototype probably of the giant Andromeda space station that was developed later on by the uh, SS and it proved successful. Uh, the most interesting story is the one that I heard by an American living in Florida who claims to have spent two months in the city of New Berlin. This is a city that was developed into the inner earth uh, and a part of the Germans from the South Polar Colony were admitted uh, by the inner earthlings and were allowed to build that city there. Uh, very strict admission procedures, no previous SS members, no previous concentration camp guards and so on were admitted. The rumor is that the present day city of New Berlin is about 2 million people of population that they have built there most of the buildings that uh, Hitler's uh, personal architect uh, Spee uh, was uh, planning to build. Uh, they're traveling on Icelandic passports. They are basically the new master race that is probably planned by the Illuminati to repopulate the planet. And uh, there is even a rumor that there is a New Berlin Embassy in Washington on an unmarked, unmarked floor of a high-rise building. You probably punch a code on the elevator buttons, and when the elevator stops on that floor and the doors open, you see the sign of New Berlin uh, in the lobby. Uh, the kids of the New Berliners uh, study in major institutions around the globe, uh, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, Yale, and basically it is not a Nazi colony uh, that is established in the hollow earth as an enemy of the present day American and English Illuminati secret government. On the contrary, it is just uh, basically the other side of the same uh, coin. Some would even <laughs> coin the new word um, the Illuminati presence on the planet, that basically the World War II Nazis and the present-day Illuminatis in America are nothing more than the two, two sides of the same Illuminati coin. So basically, this is a colony, a presence in the whole Earth that has been established with a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder cooperation of the Russians and Americans, uh, organized, orchestrated, and uh, uh, performed through the quiet cooperation of the Illuminati government. After World War II, a military expedition under Admiral Byrd tried to recover the vanished technology. The extraterrestrials let him enter the inner earth to the Golden City. They delivered a request message for disarmament to the government of the United States. Admiral Byrd had to remain silent until his death, but after he died, his nephew published his diary. By Scott's Lawn Care Products. With Scott's Greetings and welcome to the American Experience. I'm David McCullough. He was one of the last great explorers, an authentic trailblazer and ticker tape parade hero like his friend Lindbergh. Everyone knew about Admiral Richard Byrd in much the way that in another generation everyone knew about John Glenn. The handsome Admiral's expeditions to the North and South Poles held the nation spellbound, and sold lots of newspapers and books. And no wonder. It was true high adventure, combining the advances of science and extraordinary daring do in settings almost unimaginably far away, strange and breathtaking. This is the sort of account he himself wrote. It could set pulses pounding then. It still does. As the skis of the plane left the snow, I saw my shipmates on the ground jumping, shouting, throwing their hats in the air, wild with the joy that we were off to the South Pole. 
Snow-covered peaks a hundred miles away glittered like fire in the sun's reflection. What we faced far surpassed the demands of a simple flight of 800 miles to the pole. We would fly over a barren, rolling surface, then climb a mountain rampart and continue across a 10,000-foot plateau. Before us, beyond the great mountains, lay uncertainty. But then uncertainty lay at the heart of everything undertaken by this fiercely determined man. He was of no more than average height, with blue eyes and a splendid physique. At age 40, he could still chin himself with one arm. That he was more complex than he appeared comes as no surprise. It only makes his story all the more interesting. Alone on the Ice by producer Nancy Porter. June, 1934. Explorer Richard Byrd lay dying at the bottom of the world. In his diary, he wrote, I see my whole life pass in review. I realize how I have failed to see that the simple, homely, unpretentious things of life are the most important. I think Dad was as well prepared as he could have been, but no one could have been prepared for that kind of experience. Being uh, completely alone under the most difficult of circumstances. Huddled in a one-room hut, burrowed into the Antarctic ice, Bird drifted in and out of delirium, but would not call for help. His whole persona had been of the person out on the cutting edge of adventure and the frontier who really didn't need any help. Uh, Dick Bird did it alone. Dick Bird was, was the great hero. Bird was already a famous man. He had received three ticker tape parades as the first to fly to the North and the South Pole and as one of the first to fly nonstop across the Atlantic. But his greatest achievement would be opening up the vast, unknown continent of Antarctica to science and modern exploration. He dared great things, and people who dare great things uh, have many sides to them. He wanted to contribute to history and science, he wanted to make money, he wanted to become a hero. And which one won out uh, depended on the circumstance. The heroic image that Byrd created would not survive intact. Like all great men, he was driven to succeed and at some point, bound to fail. carried 52 men and an airplane. He hoped to be the first to fly to the North Pole. Dick Bird had to be first in anything he did. I think he felt always that it wasn't worth doing unless he was the first person to do it. I mean, this, this was in Dick Bird's makeup. Bird was in a race against Norwegian explorer. Roald Amundsen, the first man to reach the South Pole in 1911. Already in Spitsbergen, Amundsen hoped to conquer the North Pole in a dirigible. When Bird arrived, he was upset to find a Norwegian boat blocking the pier. He ordered his crew to construct a makeshift raft out of lifeboats. I decided to take chance and get plane ashore somehow. We may be licked, but don't want to be licked waiting around and doing nothing. So in this incredible risky maneuver in which one cake of ice, uh, one particularly dangerous wave could have knocked his airplane, his trimotor, into the water, Bird does the riskiest thing he's done in his entire career because he was bound and determined that this was his time to make it to the North Pole. Bird's plane reached the shore. 
the Norwegians were impressed. To your health and success, said Amundsen. I wish you brilliant accomplishments, replied Bird. Bird had long dreamt of being the first to the North Pole and as a child had been thrilled by the harrowing accounts of Arctic expeditions. Born in 1888, Richard Bird came from one of the first families of Virginia. Once wealthy landowners, the Birds were wiped out by the Civil War. Dick Bird was born only 23 years after Appomattox, and the whole of the South was demoralized and felt very strongly that it had to prove itself again. Bird's mother, Eleanor Bowling, was a Southern belle who encouraged her three sons, the proverbial Tom, Dick, and Harry, to rehabilitate the family name. His father, Richard Bird, was a brilliant prosecutor, but a solitary man and an alcoholic. He drove his boys hard, fostering in them a desire to succeed. Dick was the most adventurous. Danger was all that thrilled him, his mother said. In 1900, Bird was invited to visit his godfather based in the Philippines, halfway around the world. My father was extremely excited. His parents uh, were not happy about the idea, and I think his mother certainly didn't want him to go. It was much too dangerous for a small boy at the age of 12 to go alone. But Bird did travel alone and wrote letters home, which were published in the local newspaper. He came back a celebrity and got the first taste of what adventuresome travel could do in the, in the sense of awaking public awareness and you know, inciting public awe. At age 20, Bird entered the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis in search of the recognition and adventure that he now craved. There he pushed himself, but not in his studies. Bird was small, and it made him interested in athletics and in conditioning. And uh, he tried to become a great athlete, uh, or a good athlete at any rate. And in fact, all his life was uh, very proud of his physique. A fierce competitor, Bird broke his foot playing football, then broke it again in gymnastics. After Annapolis, he fell down a hatch, breaking his foot a third time. Because of his injuries, his career stalled, and he reluctantly retired from the Navy. Career ended, he wrote. Trained for a seafaring profession, temperamentally disinclined for business, a fizzle. By this time, Bird had married his childhood sweetheart, Marie Ames. From a prominent Boston family, she was attractive, totally supportive, and the love of his life. Bird's career was saved by World War I. Called back to active duty, he was eventually sent to Pensacola to train in a new field. He was one of the very early naval aviators. It was almost a foolhardy profession. Men were still learning how to build planes, and it was a very, very dangerous profession. You certainly were going to get hurt if you weren't going to get killed. Though he was afraid of flying, Bird trained as a navigator and became Naval Aviator 608. He believed this new technology would change the world and help him realize his childhood dreams. Bird uh, reasoned that if he could fly to the North Pole and back in one day in relative comfort, and accomplish what the old explorers had taken weeks or months to do, that this would gain great publicity for aviation, and incidentally for himself. After several frustrating attempts to fly to the pole as part of a Navy effort, Bird, now 38, set out to raise funds for his own Arctic expedition. 
impressed by his vision. Ford, Rockefeller, and others contributed. Newspaper rights netted him more money. Bird's future was riding on the success of his flight from Spitsbergen to the Pole. His first attempt was a failure. Just before takeoff, the landing skis collapsed. Bird was in desperate need of help. It came from an unexpected source, Bernd Balkan, a member of Amundsen's team. He was a flyer and a very good pilot. And he uh, also was a very handy person. He uh, could do practically anything with his two hands. Balkan helped to fashion special skis using the oars of the uh, lifeboats. Uh, Balkan uh, also advises Bird that the best time to take off is late at night when the temperatures are cold, the, the runway is iced over and is slicker. On May 9th, navigator Bird and pilot Floyd Bennett took off in the light of the Arctic night. What happened next is still a matter of debate. According to Byrd, they discovered an oil leak 100 miles short of the pole, but kept going. After eight and a half hours, Byrd scribbled a note to Bennett. Radio that we have reached the pole and are now returning with one motor with bad oil leak, but expect to be able to make Spitsbergen. Bird returned much earlier than expected, so the landing had to be restaged for the cameras. The flight was an American triumph. Bird's logs were sent to the National Geographic Society, the sponsor of the expedition. The society verified Bird's claim after minting a gold medal honoring him. Promoted to commander by an act of Congress, Bird said he had now entered the hero business. Bird was extremely popular after his North Polar flight. He was an aviator, and aviators were great heroes of the day. Bird was an explorer. Explorers were famous at the time. And besides that, he was a handsome man, reputed to be a model person. He didn't drink, curse, uh, go out with women. Uh, he was the kind of uh, man that uh, women hoped their daughters would marry. celebrations, Bird went home to Boston. By this time, he was the father of four young children. All of the children had a very difficult time with his absences. Uh, he was missed mightily, and uh, very much uh, we looked forward to his return. The most fun we had was during these summer times because he loved being with us. I just wanted to be with him all the time to uh, uh, listen to his wonderful stories. And of course, it was, a, it was such an adventure to be with him. He thought of all kinds of fun things to do. I adored him. And when he left, I really missed him. Soon after the North Pole flight, questions began to surface in the foreign press. Some reporters doubted whether he could have made the 1,500-mile journey to the Pole and back in so short a time. They said that they had seen a plane on the horizon and couldn't believe it because they hadn't expected the, the Josephine Ford to come back that quickly. And uh, so one of the um, reporters at the time, an aviation reporter, uh, for the Norwegian paper, Aften Posten, questioned it right away. Others doubted Bird in private. That summer, Bernd Balkan and the North Pole pilot Floyd Bennett took the Josephine Ford on a cross-country promotional tour. Bernd, as always, kept a very careful log, and it, he realized that the plane wasn't as fast as it was supposed to be. 
And he knew that something was wrong, that it couldn't have reached the North Pole. And finally, he asked Bennett. And uh, Bennett definitely told Bernd Balkan that they had not reached it. Balkan kept his story to himself. Clearly, staying on Bird's good side was a smart move for an ambitious young pilot. But doubts about the flight persist. Did Bird fall short of the pole? And if so, by how much and did he know it? The flight diary doesn't resolve the question. Was Bird's career as an explorer launched on a lie? strongly that life was a struggle. It wasn't something that you eased into and eased through. One became a hero through repeated search for transcendent challenges. And the supreme arena for surmounting them was Antarctica. One year after the North Pole flight, Byrd announced his next exploit. He planned to be the first man ever to fly over the South Pole. Operating out of a suite in the Hotel Biltmore, Byrd began organizing the most ambitious polar expedition ever undertaken. I was studying at Harvard College one night, and the door opened and in came the Boston Transcript, the evening paper of the city. And there, with banner headlines, it said, Bird to the South Pole. I read it, and at that moment, I decided I wanted to go. Norman Vaughn was among the 10,000 who volunteered. Bird wanted men with spirit, of mind and courage, and Vaughn fit the bill. Bird was also counting on the donation of goods and services, and on raising over $500,000 in cash. At that time, Antarctic expeditions weren't financed by the government. They were solely financed by the people running the expeditions. So Byrd had to raise all the money for his expedition himself. And uh, Byrd made himself a show business property. Byrd signed up with a lecture bureau, arranged a book deal, sold syndication rights to the New York Times, and the film rights to Paramount Pictures, which assigned two cameramen to the expedition. Contributions came in from philanthropists, business leaders, and even school children. Edsel Ford donated an airplane. In the midst of the preparations, Byrd was devastated when he learned of the sudden death of pilot Floyd Bennett. Bennett had been Byrd's right-hand man and closest friend. He would be hard to replace. Byrd soon named Bernd Balkan to head the aviation unit, but postponed selecting a new pilot for the South Pole flight. The Byrd Antarctic expedition was ready to go in the fall of 1928. Four ships would carry three planes, 95 dogs, 650 tons of supplies, and 42 men headed for the most dangerous adventure of their lives. The New York Times already had written an obituary for each man. Antarctica is a very inhospitable place. Uh, I think it's something like Mars. It's uh, as close to another planet as we can get on Earth. It's the driest place on Earth, the coldest, the windiest. There are no plants there. It's desolate, desolate with a capital D, and dangerous. Antarctica has, has killed men. Uh, they've fallen off mountains, fallen to the sea and drowned, froze to death, gone mad. It's a terrible place to live. Traveling through the Panama Canal, across the Pacific, and down past New Zealand, the expedition took two months to reach Antarctica. When the men began unloading supplies, a great chunk of ice crashed into one of the ships. A crewman, Benny Roth, 
fell into the water. Benny Roth was yelling for help. I can't swim. And as Bird started to climb over the taffrail and to jump into the water, I, among others, grabbed him and pulled him back. And the second we released our grip on his clothing, like a cat he was over the rail. A lifeboat rescued Benny Roth before Bird could get to him. But this was not the only time he had jumped into dangerous waters to save one of his men. Dick Bird had, I think, a natural, visceral, instinctive sense of responsibility toward others. And I think this, this showed itself in the way he would fling himself off decks to save sailors that, that were drowning. An officer took care of his men. Bird had to work quickly to prepare for the brutal Antarctic winter. Four months of total darkness from May through August. Bird chose a site for the base camp nine miles inland. It took three months just to unload. Expedition members, dressed in kangaroo hide boots, caribou gloves and fur parkas, set up the camp. Bird called it Little America. Having to build a base for 42 men that would last them for a year and a half, uh, he was really building a, a tiny little city. Bringing the stuff to the base, erecting it under awful conditions of sub-zero temperatures and fierce winds and snowstorms and ice that was hard as concrete to dig into, it was a great undertaking. Even before Little America was finished, the ships had to leave Antarctica before the ice pack froze them in. That was a tremendous moment. And we realized then that that was our last connection or possible connection with the outside world, our home, our family, our life, until next year. Alone on the ice, Bird and his men pushed to get work done before winter set in. The South Pole flight was still nine months away, and though it was his primary goal, Bird had also pledged to conduct scientific research. Antarctica was virgin territory for scientists. Glaciologists had to study how much ice was there and how it moved. The weathermen had to study the air patterns. The geologists had to study the rocks down there. Uh, so uh, gathering scientific knowledge about Antarctica was very important at the time. But Bird's personal passion lay in discovering uncharted territory and in being the one to claim it for the United States. From the air, he was able to map huge areas and make headlines back home. A New York Times reporter was on the expedition. Russell Owen had to send his reports to the Times through the radio operators who would send it by Morse code back to New York. Bird had left standing orders with the operators to give him these reports so he could look them over before they were sent. And he often uh, penciled in things that he wanted, penciled out things he didn't want. One story that was rewritten was the discovery of a vast territory by three other men from Bird's expedition. The news was reported in the Times, but with Bird as the hero. Uh, is, I think, uh, very good evidence of a need to control everything on the expedition, including any big news uh, stories. Uh, uh, you know, he was the leader of the expedition. The, uh, he was uh, personally responsible for all its uh, finances, and he simply uh, did not want to share credit for the uh, discoveries of the expedition with anybody. Winter night brought an end to exploration. The planes were stored in igloo hangars, and the dogs boarded in icy kennels. The perpetual darkness and temperatures as low as 72 degrees below zero drove the men into an underground existence. Well, you felt quite trapped. You're in one building with tunnels connecting to another building. The living space was as cramped as it could be. 
In the house where I was, it was very small quarters and two tier bunks on four walls and just a stove, and that's all there was in that room. As a precaution against fumes and asphyxiation, they turned off their stoves at night. The men lived mostly on frozen provisions, supplemented by whale and seal meat. They spent the winter preparing for the spring expeditions and dealt with the monotony by playing games, watching movies, and performing skits for each other. Whatever face Bird put on for the men, he felt very alone and depended on his wife for moral support. Darling, Marie wrote, I am wondering if the time will ever come when we can be like human beings and have a real home. Glory and fame may be all right, but we have certainly paid well for them. My mother was a very exceptional woman. It must have been extremely difficult for her to carry on alone with the responsibilities of the family and home. Dear Daddy, I love you very much. I wish you would be home more. I think I would get along much better in school if you were here. Dickie. The separation from home was hard on all the men. Enveloped in darkness, little America became a pressure cooker. So people get on each other's nerves. They uh, blew up at each other. They tended to get what they call a big eye in Antarctica, even today, where they just stare because they were depressed and uh, had little stimulation. Bird uh, had been warned about this by other polar explorers who told him, watch out for the winter. It's a very dangerous time in Antarctica. Though the Paramount cameraman made the winter look like good, clean fun, there were fist fights and an episode when one man stalked another with a gun. Alcohol was another problem. Bird, among others, was a heavy drinker, and parties frequently became all-night binges. He wasn't leading officers and enlisted men in a naval expedition. He was leading very individualistic scientists, adventurers, uh, students, uh, people who really had been pretty well used to living their own life, and after all, volunteered for the Bird expedition because they wanted adventure. Finally, in August, the sun returned to Antarctica. The men began to prepare for the flight to the South Pole. But Bird had not yet revealed who would be the pilot. The secrecy caused tension and upset Bernd Balken. It bothered Bernd that Bird had a closed personality. He would take people to the side and talk to one on one instead of talking to everybody. If he had a problem or if he wanted something specific done, he should have addressed the whole group of them. Though there was tension between the two men, they needed each other. Bird depended on Balkan's superior skill as a pilot, and Balkan wanted to share in the glory of another polar first. Finally, Bird told Balkan, you will fly to the South Pole with me. It was Thanksgiving Day, 1929, when Bird's plane, the Floyd Bennett, left for the pole. The takeoff was smooth, but there was soon trouble. The plane was too heavy to get over the high mountain range on the edge of the polar plateau. Balkan and Bird were forced to dump their emergency food supplies. But still, the plane could not get high enough. They were heading directly for a mountain peak. An experienced pilot that he was, Bernd Balkan knew there was a cold mass of air pouring over the polar plateau. And there was probably an updraft somewhere, if he could find it. So he flew over to a mountain wall, and lo and behold, there was an updraft there. He got just enough of an updraft to boost the plane high enough to get over the peak. They flew over the mountain, and they were home safe. circled the pole. Bird sent a radio message.
passage. My calculations indicate that we have reached the vicinity of the South Pole. The news was immediately relayed to New York and broadcast over loudspeakers in Times Square. The expedition had been a remarkable achievement. After 14 months on the ice, Bird and his men headed home. arrived in New York. Now promoted to Admiral, Byrd was honored with his biggest ticker tape parade. But there was no time for a break. Byrd was secretly planning another expedition and had to cash in on the last one. He published a book, Little America, a self-promoting account of his two years in Antarctica and supervised the editing of the Paramount film in his home. I remember them splicing film together and I would sneak down the back stairs and peek uh, between the cracks of the door. This documentary won the Academy Award for uh, Best Photography. It was a terrible documentary, though, I must say that. It didn't, didn't really fit the history correct. It was made uh, to show Bird as a great hero and to wring tears and sweat from the audience. It wasn't really historically true. Not everyone fell for it. A few New York sophisticates, as Bird called them, thought that the all-American image was wearing thin. But to most Americans, Bird was still a hero. Though the relentless schedule of public appearances was a trial for such a private man. What a pity it is that I have to keep a stiff upper lip and go through all kinds of stuff when I ought to be out in the woods, away from everybody. In 1931, Byrd announced a second expedition to Antarctica to map more territory and conduct scientific research. He would also have to come up with another spectacular and dangerous exploit to top his South Pole flight. So he keeps this momentum of movement and of action and of achievement going. He's really almost a guy on a treadmill. But times had changed. The country was mired in the Great Depression and money was scarce. Bird had to market himself aggressively to attract contributions and supplies for the expedition. It was easier to get volunteers. I was kind of at the crossroads and no roots down, particularly in business. And it was a challenge to find out as I was tough as these fellows that were doing these things. Bird's second expedition got underway in 1933. From the beginning, it was a media event. Bird made a deal with CBS to produce weekly broadcasts from Antarctica. General Foods was a sponsor, and Grape Nuts, the official cereal of the expedition. The first of over 60 scripted broadcasts was made from the ship on the way down. Stand by all Americans. For now we are attempting the most spectacular feat in the annals of radio. A two-way broadcast from and to the third expedition, now in this Pacific on its way to the Antarctic. Good evening, my friends of the Columbia and General Cruz. We confidently believe that in that lost world, aviation will find something of real value to humanity. What we seek lies deep in Antarctica, the last refuge of mystery and the unknown. Treacherous conditions plagued the men from the start. Every day, huge chunks of the ice shelf broke off. The route to Little America was so hazardous, it 
became known as Misery Trail. The dangers facing the expedition were featured in press reports sent home. Yesterday, a tractor narrowly missed plunging into a crevasse. The trail suddenly crumpled underneath the rear treads, exposing a crevasse 60 feet deep. The man in charge of all the press and radio on the expedition was Charles Murphy, a CBS correspondent who had written Bird's biography and was his most trusted advisor. Charles Murphy is very media astute. This is a man who, uh, even before Bird's uh, expedition, uh, was involved in cultivating Bird's uh, image as a hero, and uh, he uh, was very much concerned that uh, that image be maintained. For two years, Bird had been planning a dramatic event. No one had ever spent a winter in the interior of Antarctica. Bird would build a remote weather station far south of Little America where two or three men could live and conduct meteorological research during the long winter night. But secretly, Bird had been thinking about going alone. Now, difficult conditions caused delays and sealed his fate. Bird would go out to the weather station, advance base, by himself, with cold, darkness, and solitude, his only companions. Bird confided to Murphy that he had no other choice. Impossible to move out enough equipment for three men. To take another, he said, would incur the almost inescapable suspicion of homosexuality. To do it alone, he felt wise and proper. When Bird announced his decision to the camp, many were opposed. I said to him bluntly, Admiral, there are 56 men here on the ice. 55 of us are better equipped to go out to that base than you are. You're needed here. And he laughed and he said, well, I wouldn't ask anyone to do something that I wouldn't do myself. It has interested me how well a man could stand solitude. Also, I have had a lot of expeditions and have had to put up with things, and with men especially, that have robbed them of satisfaction. This will be without those disadvantages. In going to advance base, I think Dick Bird had run out of ideas and what to do in terms of aviation. So he really needed something, I think, spectacular as a means of effectively putting him before the public as this intrepid uh, polar uh, explorer and, and unique individual. Before he left, Bird instructed his men not to attempt a rescue before the return of full daylight in six months. In a last-minute note to Murphy, he admitted, I am no radio operator, so the radio will possibly fail. This should not be any cause for worry. Once the crew completed building the 9 by 13 foot hut, Bird was flown to the base 123 miles south of Little America and left alone. March 28th, they have gone at last. For over 200 days, I'll see no human being or any living thing. The winter night is near. The temperature is bitter from 40 to 60 below. For the first two months, Bird kept busy with his routine of weather observations and spent time listening to music, reading, and trying to cook. I have located very little of the food and don't know how to cook anyhow. I found some canned greens and a Virginia ham mother sent me and lived high off those yesterday. The greens were frozen so hard I had to use a chisel to cut it into chunks for warming. How's the music coming in, that little bird? Are you and your men enjoying Back it? Back at Little America, the men tried to keep busy throughout the winter night. Their weekly radio programs provided comic relief. It was Murphy's job to write the scripts and to conjole the men into performing. I don't want to 
Bird expedition calling from Middle America. Temperature tonight, 59 below. Tonight we introduce, for the first and probably last time, a composition, it is called Penguin Parade. singing group was the Knights of the Gray Underwear. Dr. Gil Morgan, our seismologist, was our, our organist. And I sang tenor. It was more as an amusement, but I do believe, based on uh, reports from home, that I think people really did look forward to that program every week. On these Saturday nights, when they had the broadcast from Little America, Mother would wake us up take us down to uh, Dad's big bed. It's a great big Italian bed, and I can remember the static and listening to the broadcast down there. They were very exciting. On June 21st, Bird radioed Murphy a surprising message. He said he wanted to come home three months ahead of schedule. Bird then cut the contact short, saying that fumes from his stove made him feel a little rocky. He signed off, as usual, with Cheerio. What Bird didn't reveal was that he had been desperately ill. Three weeks earlier, he had collapsed from carbon monoxide poisoning. He basically was poisoned for a prolonged period of time by fumes which he thought were coming from his stove, but in fact were coming from his uh, generator. He went through a, a pretty terrible ordeal. Bird became dizzy and confused. He couldn't keep food down and racking pain made it almost impossible to sleep. He lay in the freezing cold, struggling between hope and despair. The hardest battle I have is to keep from taking an overdose of sleeping pills. Horrible to think of leaving Marie alone with the four children. Decision not to call for help based upon how they would want me to act. Fully expect to die. Bird's radio contacts with Little America became erratic and his Morse code almost indecipherable. We began to suspicion that something was wrong with him when uh, he would miss a, uh, a contact or have trouble staying on the air very long. And as time went on, this became so frequent that we decided that something was really wrong and something had to be done. We held several meetings in the mess hall and there were factions, some were saying, well, he asked for it. I'll let him stew in his own juice for a while. Others fought and said, no, the old man's out there. He needs help. Let's go out and rescue him. On July 20th, a tractor party left Little America for advance base. Murphy's press release reports a perilous trip for scientific research. No mention was made of Bird's illness or of a rescue. We were very concerned about the men that were running the tractors to go out after him. Recognizing the difficulties, we knew that they were risking their lives literally to do it. Fifty miles out, the tractors ran into a huge field of crevasses. The tractor party wired Murphy. Unable to locate trail around crevassed area. Many flags completely covered under snow. Inadvisable to proceed. Murphy instructed them to come back. He wanted to wait a month when daylight would return before risking another attempt. But for the next three days, Little America was unable to contact advance base. Finally, they received from Bird an explicit call for rescue. Murphy wrote in his diary, making ready for a second dash to advance base. The Admiral has called for it. God help us if anything goes wrong. But the second attempt failed because of engine problems. 
Murphy then received another desperate message from Bird. Charlie and Bill, what in God's name is matter? Do something. Use all resources. Do not risk life. Can't keep this up. On August 8th, a tractor carrying three men set out once again. By now, Murphy and the others were certain Bird was close to death. We waited for the reports back from the tractor party on how they were proceeding, what difficulties they were encountering, and uh, just holding our breath literally from report to report. For three days, the rescue party pushed through bitter cold and darkness and finally reached Bird. The men found him thin and weak, his cabin littered with debris. But he was still alive. He wanted to do this as, as a spectacular act of courage and, and so on, but I don't think he ever expected to run into the disaster that he did. There's very strong indication in the documents that he was embarrassed and one could even say he was humiliated by the fact that he didn't finish his time at advance base. The tractor party sent a confidential message to Murphy. Our EB feels unhappy about his status with the public. He feels that he is pretty well sunk and that this may make it impossible for him to make up expedition debt. Six months after Bird's rescue, the expedition headed home. Bird had claimed more land and conducted important scientific research, but privately, he felt he had failed. He was 47 years old. Here was a man whom I had last seen, a, a straight-backed, black-haired man. And here he was coming down the gangplank, holding on to both sides of but stooped with some of his hair having turned gray. And all I wanted to do was to just run out to him and tell him how much I loved him and how happy I was to see him. And I extend to all of you, in behalf of the American people, a hearty welcome home. And let me add just one thing from the heart. Dick, I salute you. <laughs> After all the speeches were over, the crowds broke through the ropes, and I can remember that I just rushed right through and up to Dad. And he turned to me and he said, not here, dear, later when we were alone. And I was crushed. It had been about three years since I had seen him last. Now, Dad was raised uh, at a time when you didn't express outwardly love or pain. He may have been crying inside as much as I was, but you didn't do that in public. Three years later, Bird published Alone, an heroic version of his isolation and adventure. It became a bestseller. The book was meant to pave the way for Bird's next expedition. Within a short time, polar exploration would be in the hands of the U.S. government. Eventually, Byrd was needed only as a figurehead. He was trapped in his own self-image of the intrepid polar explorer who overcame great odds and who had to go back time and time and time again to find new trials and new tests of strength. When he said to people, they don't want me anymore, what he meant was they didn't want him as he perceived himself, as the leader of polar expeditions. No longer running the show, Bird spent more time with Marie and his family. Perhaps he found some solace in what he had learned from his time at Advance Base. Out of this experience, his sense of values changed and his faith grew. He and he said, in the final analysis, only two things really mattered. 
and that was the affection and the understanding of his family. Bird made his last trip to the ice in 1955. Two years later, the man who introduced America and generations of scientists to Antarctica died of heart failure at the age of 68. Bird's statue at Arlington National Cemetery immortalizes the heroic persona that he spent his life creating. But that image would be tarnished. In 1971, Bernd Walken went public with his claim that years earlier, pilot Floyd Bennett had told him that Bird had not reached the North Pole. Whatever the truth, the claim cast a shadow over the legacy of the last great polar explorer. In an editorial after Bird's death, the New York Times wrote, Such men are not easy characters. They burn with a bright flame. They go on their way alone, partly because they stand on a narrow summit.